Hola. The following video episode was originally recorded in English. There are subtitles available in both Spanish and English. If you prefer to listen to the audio version of this episode, go to the website theengineeringprofessor.org slash podcast or subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. This podcast and website are intended to provide informative and thought-provoking content to our listeners and readers. The opinions and views expressed by the hosts and guests on the show and website are their own and do not necessarily reflect the views of their employers or funding agencies. Hola, everybody. Welcome to the Engineering Professor Speaks Education podcast. I am Cindy Rivera Jimenez, and in this bilingual scientific communication space, we explore together the art, science, and politics of being an effective engineering educator. Today, we have an incredible guest, Dr. Sarah Wilson, who will be discussing her expertise in engineering education. Dr. Wilson is an assistant professor in the Chemical and Materials Engineering Department at the University of Kentucky. For those of you that don't know her yet, Dr. Wilson has a bachelor degree from Rowan University and a PhD from the University of Massachusetts, both in chemical engineering. Her journey began in 2015 when she joined the university as a lecturer in chemical engineering. In August 2020, Dr. Wilson's efforts were recognized as she was promoted to an assistant professor with a research focus in engineering education. In recognition for the de her dedication, Dr. Wilson received a, a prestigious NSF brief uh, grant, which stands for Research Initiation in Engineering Formation, in 2020. Through this research, she expanded her skill sets in social science research and gained expertise in both qualitative and quantitative research methods. So welcome, Sarah, to the Engineering Professor Speaks Education. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited. Yeah, I'm very excited too. Um, Sarah and I have started this uh, NSF Reef journey kind of together uh, since we decided to submit it uh, in 2019 in an mm -hmm. AICAC conference to now supporting each other through this journey. So I'm really happy to have a conversation with you that is not just about the everyday things, but it's actually about knowing more about your research. Yes, I'm very excited to be able to talk with you. So one of the things that we do in this podcast is to understand what makes you unique. Okay, everybody has a story, and I told a little bit about who you are, but can you summarize uh, how you became an engineering professor and how you are now doing engineering education research? Yeah, so I think really getting into engineering, I think I followed a similar pathway that a lot of students do of I liked chemistry, I liked math, and I decided to put them together and go into chemical engineering. And I really didn't know what I was signing up for. And I think that's the case for a lot of students when they start their undergraduate career. They don't know what they're signing up for. They just hear chemical engineering and think it sounds fun. And then there they go. So thankfully, I got into a program that I really fell in love with. I went to Rowan University. And one of the really great things about Rowan is it's really widely known across the country for its focus on undergraduate education and high quality undergraduate education. So being someone doing research in engin engineering education and being someone that really puts a lot of energy into chemical engineering education, I got to see during my undergraduate career some of the best teachers that are recognized at ASCHE and all of these different conferences for engineering education. And that was really a wonderful experience for me getting to see that fantastic education. Uh, so then I went into my PhD and I got to gain experience in teaching through TA positions mm -hmm. and through mentorship in the lab and really fell in love with the educational side and being able to inspire students and get them excited about the work that I was doing in the lab or the work that we were doing in the classroom. That was what I was really passionate about, was really inspiring other people to get excited and to really think about a problem and really learn problem solving skills. And I think that really is what led me into focusing on undergraduate education when I went into my career. So in 2015, I started, or 2014, I started applying for positions, and all of those positions were focused entirely on education. So I applied for teaching faculty positions, lecturer positions, adjunct positions, entirely focused on undergraduate education. 
Um, and that really was that transition for me into an educational position focused on teaching in the classroom. Um, and I started that position back in 2015. In that role, I really got to focus on teaching in the laboratory course. Um, so that was a really fun experience for me getting to to really think about how do we teach engineering students this really diverse set of skills that aren't necessarily what they're learning in their lecture classes, right? How do we teach them how to problem solve? How do we teach them how to communicate and work effectively in teams? There's so much that we have to include in a lab course that are, are skills that they're really not able to practice in just traditional lecture classes. Um, and that really gave me the opportunity to think about engineering education and the skills that we need to be teaching students and how to approach it almost from a research perspective. How do we start to recognize what skills do students need and what support that students need to be able to be effective as students and effective as engineers as well. Um, and I think that was really that course allowed me to transition into the educational space and starting research around communication for engineering students and then process safety for engineering students and then kind of further experiences with students leading to my current research that's really focused around kind of this more holistic mental health of engineering students. And I really like your story. And I, this is kind of like a common thread uh, in different uh, people that I have interviewed in the season is the fact that many of us couldn't find a tenure track role that is dedicated to teaching. And the mm -hmm. reason why we decide to go in this non-tenure track pathway is because it's the only option where you can really have the career that you want in teaching or education, right? So um, I really like that story that you tell, right? That, you know, you were really uh, motivated by your previous university and how that kept, you know, kind of like defining the, the common pathway. So I'm, I'm really excited to hear about your research now. Cause if you could summarize briefly, because we're going to talk a, a little bit more in detail. What is your research and when exactly did you knew like you weren't going to pursue this new career pathway? Yeah, so I kind of started research just through my educational experiences, right? And starting to teach in the classroom, recognizing where are there are gaps on things that I wanted to do more effectively and how could we approach that from a research perspective, right? And going through to the American Society for Engineering Education Conference, you get really inspired about the questions that people are asking in the classroom and the way that they're going about improving their teaching in a research way, as opposed to just doing and seeing what happens, right? So how do we go about this in a more research direction? And that really was what led me into kind of the start of my research was just, I'm interested in doing this more effectively. How do I answer that question? And how do I ask research questions that allow me to teach this more effectively. So a lot of the research that I started was focused on communication in the classroom and how do we more effectively match communication that we're teaching students in the classroom to what the skills they actually need once they're out on the job. So that was kind of a natural fit with the work that I was teaching or what I was teaching in the laboratory course. And I started working on some of that work um, initially and then I, I got involved with a group of researchers uh, focused on process safety. And that, again, was directly tied to the research that I was doing in the lab. And I think that was a really great experience to start to learn some of those skills for re research. But it wasn't necessarily in my number one passion area, right? So really, the, the place that I'm really passionate about doing research right now is in supporting students and supporting student mental health. This journey into research on mental health has really come about based on experiences that I've had through my career, experiences that I've had really with my family, experiences that I've had with students within the classroom. Um, in particular, I had one semester where I had multiple students that were really struggling within my courses, and they were coming to me and kind of revealing these struggles to me. And I really didn't know what to do and didn't know how to respond and didn't know what I should be doing to support them. And within even my department, even within my network of people, I think a lot of people were facing very similar challenges of not knowing how to support the students that were struggling within their classes and not knowing even what resources we should be guiding these students to. So that was really a first hint that there was a problem that was going on within engineering that really we didn't have very good resources on how to address. 
And then moving forward from that, I went to the American Society for Engineering Conference in the summer of 2019. And there was an open mic where we just were having a conversation as chemical engineering faculty and engineer um, at the conference, a room of probably 100 people. And we were having a conversation around student mental health. And they asked the question, how many of you have had a student that has struggled with mental health in the classroom? And every single faculty member raised their hand, right? Everyone. And that wasn't surprising, but it still was just impactful. But then they asked the question of how many of you have lost a student to suicide? And within that room of 100 faculty, probably 20 faculty had their hands up. So it was a really significant number. And it really was deflating for the entire room because everyone had this same reaction of what do we do? We don't know what to do to support this. We don't know what to do to make this better. We don't know what to do. Um, And it was really deflating kind of walking out of that room. And that was really the motivating piece for me to really start doing this work and I kind of left that conference and started working right then on putting together my first NSF reef proposal uh, that you and I talked about. Um, And I really started working on that right at that point. And that was really the work that helped to inspire me and get me into this more, I would say, rigorous research in engineering education. Um, And it's just been a really big passion area for me. It's something that I've always been really passionate about. And being able to have that as a focus of my research has been something that has felt really empowering for me because it does feel like it's research that can have a really big impact on our students. Yeah, that's that's a great story. Um, and it's impressive the role the role that the professional societies may have in us, right? Um, so for those of you that don't know, AICHE stands for American Institute of Chemical Engineers, uh, which is a professional organization that um, both Sarah and I belong to. And they have a chemical engineering division, education division, where we're very active uh, in there. So uh, before we move to the next question, I, I really want to hear your opinion on what is the role of participating? If you're a lecturer and you want to start understanding how to do a little bit of more rigorous engineering education research, what is the role of, of these conferences, uh, particularly in your career? So I would say for me, being able to find the network of people that are doing work in the space. In chemical engineering, I can say I'm Specifically, there are amazing faculty that are in teaching faculty roles and tenure track roles that are really focused and passionate about undergraduate education. So if you are someone that is really like trying to drive undergraduate education at your institution, there are people that are doing the work. And one of the things that I learned really quickly through my career is we can't do this alone effectively, right? I think having that network and having that support structure, not only personally for our own mental health and our own like just support, but also be to be able to share resources and share the way that we're doing things and learn from each other and learn how to teach more effectively is so important. So whether or not you're interested in, in getting into educational research, I don't think it matters. The benefits that come out of these conferences and just leaving inspired about what other people are doing allows you to then take some of those ideas and implement them in your own classroom and learn and grow from that and kind of help to contribute back to to the community. We have amazing people and they all want to work to support us and do better for chemical engineering students. That's all of our motivation, right? That's why we are in these careers. So being able to get access to that network of people is really, really important and can really be motivating for your own career. So in the same line, right, one of the, 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 one of the important things about this podcast is to reach out to, you know, teaching faculty, educators, practitioners, researchers, uh, and an important aspect uh, on, on the job that we do is this idea of having a teaching and mentoring philosophy. Can you tell us a little bit more about what is your teaching and mentoring philosophy? What are your principles that you use and how does your research influence the changes or optimization or that of that teaching and mentoring philosophy? Yeah, so I'll start with kind of the more boring side and then go to the more connection to the research. I think with my teaching philosophy, a lot of what I really am interested in teaching and really focusing on in every classroom is teaching these skills that aren't necessarily the ones that are in the book, right? I think a lot of the things that I'm really interested and passionate about teaching are 
not necessarily soft skills, but the, these skills that students can learn in terms of creativity and problem solving and teamwork and communication that they aren't going to find in their textbook. A lot of our students are really, they love getting to the correct answer. They love the math. They love the science. But these other skill sets really help to set them apart once they're out on the job. So how can we really work to integrate a lot of those skills into the classroom in a way that students are really growing in how they're able to apply what they're learning in the classroom by learning these other types of skills as well. Um, so for instance, something like problem solving is a skill that I'm really, really passionate about teaching, especially in the, the lab classroom, right? So how do I teach students really structured ways of going about thinking about their data and the data they've collected in the lab and solving problems and, and really going through that process in a way that's really similar to how they would do that out in industry. Right. A lot of what engineers are required to do is take a lot of information, put it all together and use that data to be able to give insight into what's going on within a system. Right. So how do we really integrate that into a course like the lab class or in thermodynamics where we can give them the skills to be able to really think creatively about problems and think about how things are interacting? I think that's something that I, I'm really passionate about. Communication, I'm really passionate about teamwork and communication in every single class. And I talk to students about the fact that I put teams in there for their homework. I do that not only for them to build skills and knowledge together on thermodynamics, but also build teamwork skills and learn communication all at the same time, right? By doing teamwork in the classroom, we're giving students the opportunity to communicate to each other about the topics within the course and use the weird language that we're teaching them in the class and get comfortable with the language of being a chemical engineer um, and learning to communicate across different levels, right? They will have different levels of knowledge within their teams and being able to communicate across that not only helps them to learn the content better, but also helps them develop their communication skills. Um, moving forward into kind of the more specific research connection with mental health, I think when I started my career as a teaching faculty member, and I think a lot of people are in a similar boat when they're starting is, I'm going to give every student the same experience. And in doing that, I'm making it fair for everyone, right? And that's kind of thinking about like equity versus inclusivity, right? If I give everyone the same thing, will they have equal access? We all know now that that's not the truth, right? So being able to teach my courses in a way that I'm trying to give everyone equal access to knowledge rather than trying to give them all the same information. Um, so I think that's something I'm really trying to work and integrate into my course is how do I create these courses that are more inclusive of the students within the classroom? And how do I integrate policies into my courses that give all students access to that knowledge and all students access to the ability to do well within my classes, right? Rather than just kind of teaching to that middle student that is kind of the one that has all the privileges of being able to focus entirely on the student or on the classroom and things like that. Um, so really trying to create inclusive classroom that can help them to be able to prioritize their mental health and gives them that ability to support them themselves as they're going through the class. That's really fascinating. Um, and I mean, one of the things that we want to focus uh, in the discussion today is that what you have to, to talk about education, right? And that particular work that you're doing and I mean, as part, you just got the, in 2020, you got the, the Reef uh, grant, but you already have a couple of publications on that topic. So, um, you know, I'm going to put in the show notes, uh, like the specific publications that you have uh, published, but um, can you describe a little bit the motivation behind your research and on particularly student mental health? And I know that you talk about a specific aspects of uh, mental health in your research. Can you explain that to our audience? Yeah, so kind of as a research group, I'm really interested in learning how to, to support students and their mental health, not just prevent mental illness within engineering students, but kind of defining mental health as giving students the ability and the, the support to be able to be effective engineers, right? I don't think mental health is just mental illness. I think mental health is giving them access and the ability to, to live healthy lifestyles where they're able to be as successful as they can be. Um, so with that, the research specifically that I'm doing on mental health and engineering, um, a large focus of my research is focused around help seeking and engineering students. So we looked at national data uh, from a study called the Healthy Minds Study. 
and looked at analysis of that data and determined that if you look at engineering students that are self-reporting symptoms of mental health distress, those students are less likely to have sought help for their mental health when compared to mentally distressed students from outside of engineering. So we call this a treatment gap. So when students have symptoms of a disorder, mental health um, concern, and they're not seeking access or getting access to the help that they need is called a treatment gap. And what we're really trying to do within our research is understand what is causing students to not seek help for their mental health. So what beliefs do engineering students have about this idea of seeking help for their mental health that are preventing them from getting into the in the door to therapy? Right. There's a lot of things that can be driving that. And we're really using a theory called the integrated behavioral model that helps us to be able to understand what are the different types of beliefs that students have that can influence whether or not they would perform this behavior of seeking help for their mental health. And then once we have that information, how can we use that to identify these beliefs that are preventing them from going in and prioritizing their mental health and, and seeking help for their mental health. So our goal is to be able to get to interventions that are designed based on the outcomes of the research that we're doing right now. Yeah. And I want to point to the audience that your work is not like, oh, I have this instrument and I'm using it and replicating it in like whatever. Like, no, you do have proposed a systematic way of um, designing the instrument and refining that instrument. Can you walk us through that? I know that you're doing qualitative work and quantitative work. Can you explain that work, to, uh, that methodologies to our audience? Absolutely. Um, so one of the things that I think when I got started in doing research as an, in engineering as a teaching faculty member, without really having that skill set in, in educational research methods, I just kind of asked questions and really just try to implement things and measure the impact, right? And in doing research on mental health, one of the first things that we really focused on within my group is trying to define the problem, right? Rather than me assuming what the problem is based on my own perspective and my own experiences, which will represent, again, my own experiences, how do I go through and define the problem that is there for the community as opposed to just what I've experienced, right, as I went through my education? And here my cat makes an appearance. So um, through that, how do I really work on that? And one of the things that we really identified was this problem of help seeking within engineering students. And we use theory to be able to understand what are some of those different beliefs that influence students' mental health. So our goal through first starting out with the reef proposal that we wrote was to really go through and use this theory that we have and interview students to really understand what are those driving beliefs that they have that might influence whether or not they would seek help for their mental health. So all of our interviews were really driven by this theory called the integrated behavioral model, which gives us different categories of beliefs that influence help seeking. So for instance, we ask students about perceived barriers and facilitators to seeking help for their mental health or um, what people in their lives might support or not support them seeking help for their mental health. Those are different types of beliefs that they have that would influence that behavior. And we went through and we did interviews with these engineering students at the University of Kentucky to be able to get this comprehensive list of beliefs. Our goal through doing those interviews at UK was really to, to interview as diverse a population as possible at the University of Kentucky but we also understood our limitations in doing the study solely at the University of Kentucky, right? University of Kentucky is a primarily white institution, so we were very limited in the access that we had to students from other backgrounds. Um, and we did our best within what we could at the University of Kentucky. Um, through the, those interviews, what we were able to do was create this long comprehensive list of beliefs that have the potential to influence help seeking behavior. And we put that together into this help seeking instrument called the engineering mental health help seeking instrument. Um, and with that, we went through and did quantitative data collection to be able to see how well are the beliefs that we identified predicting whether or not students would intend to seek help for their mental health. So that's what we did at the University of Kentucky is created this version one of this instrument that is really focused around being able to determine which beliefs that engineering students have that are predictive of whether or not they would seek help for their mental health. And moving forward into this second grant that we got, so we got an NSF Research in the Formation of Engineers grant in August of 2022. 
And what we're doing with that work is really taking what we've learned from the University of Kentucky and ensuring that it also represents the perspectives of students from other institutions. So we've been working with a Hispanic serving institution and an HBCU to be able to do focus groups with those students to identify beliefs that aren't represented on our current instrument, right? We don't want to assume that the uh, the beliefs that we identified at the University of Kentucky are representative of students at these other institutions. So how can we ensure that we create this instrument that's really pre- representative of perspectives of students from different cultural backgrounds in different institutional contexts, et cetera? So that's really what we've been working on for the past year is taking this initial draft of our instrument and adapting that to ensure that it has that representation of students from these different perspectives. And then we'll take that forward and be able to use that to be able to do quantitative data collection over the next couple of years and be able to identify targets for interventions at these different institutions uh, within our study. And I want to... I, I want to tell the audience that I'm going to put on the show notes. Uh, there's a paper that I really like. I'm actually using it for the course that I'm developing that is called Distinctions Between Theory, Theoretical Framework, and Conceptual Frameworks. Uh, this is from Varpio. And, you know, it is important that you understand that it, you take this theory and then you contextualize it to create this conceptual framework that in your case is this instrument, right, as an output of uh, understanding the different ways, the variables or, or you know aspects of dimension of that concept, conceptual framework within engineering, right, context apply. So probably you apply that theory in another field or another area, right, different groups, which is what you're trying to explore, right, expand it. Um, it may change, right, the observations that you get. So I'm going to put that in the show notes so people can read and learn a little bit more about that. So... A question for you. Do you have any preliminary results, particularly, I don't know, in terms of the qualitative or quantitative phase? What is the status of of that project? So really what we've been doing as we've gone through and analyzed the data is we started by just analyzing the data in a way that we could create our instrument. And now we're going back through the data set and really doing this more rigorous analysis of the qualitative data that we've collected. So we have a paper right now that is out in review that is focused around facilitators and barriers to help seeking within the engineering student population. So with that, we've identified a lot of things that are similar to students from outside populations, right? This is not all unique to engineering students. So some some things like structural barriers, not being able to get access to an appointment at the counseling center, um, not knowing how to access an appointment, having to navigate insurance and things like that. Those are things that are very similar for all student populations. We don't expect those things to be unique to engineering students. But one of the things that really came through in a lot of our interviews is that engineering students really feel like they're so limited in time that in order for them to go and seek help for their mental health, they're going to have to sacrifice time And that sacrifice of time they perceive as a sacrifice of their academics. And then they also feel like if they're sacrificing their academics, they also can be further impacting their mental health, right? So it's kind of this cycle that they see that they would have to go through where if I give up the time to prioritize my mental health and go seek help from a therapist, I'm going to be losing time that I could be spending on my my academics. And in the end, that's going to make me feel even worse. So I'm going to end up even more stressed because I'm losing out on that academics. So really, academics are such a, an important part of our students' identity and, and how they feel that they bring a lot of value to themselves. And they put so much weight in that, that that can impact whether or not they feel like they can give up even a little bit of that to be able to prioritize mental health. Um, there's also a lot of influence of just the culture of engineering. So there's this expectation around kind of perfectionism. They feel like if they're struggling, they might be one of the only ones struggling. They're not necessarily having conversations around that. And they feel like they feel like they have to have it all together all the time, right? Our students really feel a lot of pressure to to be in control and to solve all their problems on their own because we're teaching them how to be effective problem solvers, right? So when they face challenges, they feel like they have to navigate them in their own way. So I think that's a challenge that we're facing and that we have to get students to recognize that 
a big part of being able to effectively solve problems is recognizing what resources you have available to you and recognizing how to access those resources to solve the problem most effectively, right? Something like mental health, sure, you can look it up online and you can learn about it yourself, but that's not the most effective way to support your own mental health and solve that problem, right? The most effective way is to go to the expert and get their support to be able to help solve the problem and and kind of work through it with you, right? And that's the same way we go about solving engineering problems, right? We have to recognize when we're at a limit to our own knowledge and when there's someone else that we can bring in to support the problem solving process, right? So being able to solve problems is a big part of that is accessing outside resources and accessing support. So how do we teach students to think about their mental health in that same way? That is really impressive because I, I, I know you from before you started this project and I'm hearing at you and I mean, you have grown tremendously, you know, in the way you're communicating all of this. And one of the things that I have found out that many people that have that type of growth, right, is because of the collaborators or mentors. And one of, one of the key aspects of the NSF Reef, and again, I'm going to put information about the Reef because we're both recipients of that uh, amazing proposal, uh, amazing grant, um, is the role of the mentors. Can you talk about how you come up with, you know, going from that previous or, uh, older Sarah and and now you at this point in your career? Yeah, I, I wouldn't be here without mentorship and support from so many people, right? Um, you included, right? I think that there's so many people. There's a, a whole village involved in kind of our evolution and our our process here. And a big part of that is the NSF Reef grant and the the mentorship that I received through that. So I applied for the grant with two mentors. Uh, One is Ellen Usher, who was in uh, educational psychology at the University of Kentucky. Um, She's now up doing research in education at the Mayo Clinic up in Minnesota. Um, So she was my first mentor and also um, Joseph Hammer, who was a counseling psychologist at the University of Kentucky. And through that process of the Reef Grant, I got so much support from them on how to go through this process in a rigorous way, right? There's such a new skill set that you have to learn in doing social science research, and it can be really overwhelming. So having someone else to be able to talk through the methods and talk through the process, it's hard, right? Especially as you're trying to learn this on your own. And especially doing qualitative research is such a circular process that you feel like you're making progress and then you're kind of pushed back. But that's just how it goes, right? It's this really circular process, really getting to know and be intimately familiar with the data that you've collected and what you're learning from that. It requires a lot of going back to the beginning and thinking through in different ways so that you really learn what's coming out of that data. And not having support through that process would have been really difficult and really, I'm not sure that I could have done it, right? I think I would have hit enough roadblocks that I would have felt like I was, wasn't was making enough progress, but having them there to support me through that really helped me to feel like we were moving in the right direction, even when we had to take those steps back and kind of reevaluate how we were going through the process. So I think that was so crucially important. And it also opened up opportunities for us to continue collaborations. So Ellen has since left the university and is working at the Mayo Clinic. Um, But Joe and I have been able to continue and get a secondary grant on the work that we did through the reef. And in doing that, we're able to expand the impact of the work that we've done. So we've moved from this more mentorship position. And not to say that he's no longer my mentor, because he definitely is. But now it's a much more collaborative relationship as well, where we're working together and we're contributing different aspects to the project, which I think has been a really wonderful outcome of that grant. And now we've also been able to expand it out to other types of projects as well. So a lot of the work that I do around mental health, he's a huge resource for me because he's this counseling psychologist. He has that expertise that I think is such an important part of studying mental health is bringing in someone that has that expertise rather than assuming that I have that on my own. And and that is the key. That is the key that if you really want to do social research, you have to understand that you know what type of problems and question your students in engineering may have but you may need the help of somebody with the expertise to support you in answering those questions. 
Oh, absolutely. And I think eventually we learn how to study things independently, right? That's the reality. We learn these skill sets, but at the start, like, this is a whole new PhD, right? So that's what my mentor told me. Like Joe and I had the conversation when I went through the Reef Grant, it's essentially getting a second PhD. You are not necessarily doing all the nitty gritty data collection in the same way because I had a graduate student that helped to support that. But you're learning this whole new skill set of research tools that you've never used before. So that's huge, right? Being able to go through and do that and you need the support, you need the guidance to be able to get through that process. Because learning it on your own, I'm sure that some people can do it. I would not have been able to do it. I know that very much about myself. So wrapping up this uh, part of the conversation about mental health. So where do you see the conversation about mental health and engineering going in the future? I think there has to be a cultural shift within engineering, right? We're making all of these pushes pushes and drives to increase the diversity of engineering, which I think is so crucially important. But in doing that, we're also now bringing in students that need different support structures, right? That need different support. And that involves a lot of cultural change to create an environment that can provide all of these students with opportunities for success, right? Right now, I think a lot of what impacts mental health within engineering are these traditional masculine norms of driving all of your decisions solely based on logic, right? So emotion doesn't even come into play because a lot of engineering traditionally is just driven by logic and math, right? So these masculine norms are making it really difficult for students to be able to express when they're struggling with their mental health. So how do we create an environment that is not only supportive of our male students, but also our female students and students from other marginalized identities Uh, that are allowing them to express themselves and and know how to really communicate about what they need and the supportive environment that they need. Um, So I really think there has to be a cultural shift. I think we have to be more open to have conversations around not only mental health, but also just accepting that none of us are perfect, right? I think a lot of students have this perception that engineers have it all together all the time. And as faculty, we have it all together all the time. But struggle and challenge is a huge part of everything that that we deal with within our lives, right? It's a huge part of our growth as humans. It's a huge part of our growth as engineers. So how do we start to more normalize those conversations and normalize struggle and normalize failure within the engineering context in a way that is allowing students to grow more effectively and recognize that when they're facing these challenges, that it's not a fault, right? That it's not them being weak. It's not a weakness. It's not a fault. It's something that's normal that everyone is going through. Um, And I think to do that, really having these cultural shifts is really, really crucial. It is. It is. Um, I want to say that, um, you know, I remember when I started doing education research, I had like uh, like an identity crisis, like, oh, will I abandon, abandon my chemical engineering roots? So I, I think Sara is kind of like the same way because we have so such a strong community in the chemical engineering, uh, you know, engineer uh, profession, right? I mean, these are our friends. They have seen us for multiple years. They have supported us during this transition. So Sara still has research that she conducts in chemical engineering. So Sara, can you tell us about that work that you have in Unit Operations Lab and who are your collaborators and what is it about? Yeah. So when I was first getting into research and engineering education, um, I saw a presentation. I think Tracy Carter and Janie Brennan um, were leading that presentation, but it was focused around process safety and integration of process safety into the unit operations lab. Mm -hmm. Since that time, I got involved in the group and our group is now Tracy Carter, um, who is at Northeastern University, Chris Barr, who is at University of Michigan, Janie Brennan, who is at Washington University in St. Louis, Joanne Beckwith, who is at Carnegie Mellon, uh, Samira Azarin, who's at University of Minnesota, and Amy Carlson, who's at University of Maryland. Um, And with that group, we've really focused on a few different aspects of how we can more effectively teach the unit operations lab. So first, we were focused on integration of process safety And one of the things that we did was study the impact of incident reporting and how using incident reporting and integrating it into 
the unit operations lab impacted the safety culture um, and impacted students' knowledge around process safety, environmental safety, and personal safety. Um, and that was a really fun project that we were able to work on where we had students report incidents on a daily basis when they were in the lab, just documenting if they had safety incidents or near misses, so things that could have gone wrong that didn't because they stopped them, documenting that process and using that to reflect on what are safe operations within the lab and what are some of those more risky operations within the lab that potentially we could make safer. And that was a really great project. Uh, since then and since COVID, we really helped to navigate COVID in the unit operations lab together, um, along with a big virtual community of practice through the ASEHE community. And with that, we've really started to reflect on what should we be teaching in a unit operations course, right? I talked about communication and the differences in what we need to teach from a communication or what we teach in the classroom and what's required on industry. I think we can do the same reflection around learning outcomes in the unit operations lab. So what we've really been trying to reevaluate since COVID, because during COVID, we really had to think about how do we meet our learning outcomes and what is required for that? Because oftentimes we think of a unit operations course is driven around specific experiments but the experiments aren't the unit, they aren't the learning outcomes, right? What they're learning as they're running the experiment are the learning outcomes of the lab. So really trying to focus in on what are the most important learning outcomes that we should be addressing within the lab and how do we try to identify them in a way that we're taking into perspective the different stakeholders that are involved in a laboratory course. So what we did is we put together a survey trying to understand what are those important learning outcomes by not only surveying faculty, right? Because faculty have one perspective on what a unit operations course should cover. Students, because students also have their own perceptions of what should be covered within that class, but also going out to industry and using industry stakeholders to be able to identify what are the core skills that they think that should be covered in this unit operations class to help students be as prepared as possible when they're going out into industry. Right. I think being able to involve different levels of stakeholders in research, I think, is so crucial to be able to create a product, right, that actually meets meets the needs of the people that are utilizing it. Right. And the, our unit operations course is really a product that's trying to meet the needs of students, of the faculty teaching the course and of the people out in industry that will be working with these students and making sure that they have the skill sets that they need. And it's interesting because people may hear you and say, why you're taking so much time to understand a lab? And I, I, for chemi, non-chemi audience, you know, um, you know, we have courses that are really important in engineering overall, like capstone design, freshman design, uh, first year design, I'm sorry. Uh, so what is a unit operation lab and why it is so important for the chemical engineering curriculum? So important that is almost hand to hand with the design course. Yeah, yeah, I would say, I mean, I've taught it. I would say sometimes it's more important, right? There's different skills that are coming out of both of them. Um, but Unit Operations Lab, the reason we call it Unit Operations is thinking about chemical engineering, our goal of kind of where we're aiming to get students is in theory to be able to design an entire chemical plant, right? That's what they do in the design course, which is such an important part of their final curriculum. And if you think about a, a chemical plant, one of the things that we want students to be able to do is break down that chemical plant into individual pieces of equipment. And their courses that they're teaching is really teaching them the fundamentals of theory that drive the performance of each of those individual pieces of equipment, right? Even within a reactor, you have mixing. So you have transport going on, you have heat transfer, you have reactions, you have separations that are all happening all at the same time within that process. And the unit operations lab is the first time where they're going from these theory courses and they're connecting that information all together to be able to understand unit operations. And these unit operations are those individual pieces of equipment that they put together to be able to create an entire chemical plant. So this is the first time where they're really starting to see that cross connection across the curriculum and see, OK, if I'm working with a reactor system, how do I apply heat transfer principles to understand if there's barriers to heat transfer within my reactor? So when I'm controlling the reactor at this temperature, it's actually a gradient of temperatures, 
right? Or separations, how does heat transfer within a separate a distillation column impact how that separation is being performed or fluid flow and pressure gradients in the column influence how that separation is being performed. So it's really getting them to think about, okay, we have this big data set. How do we understand based on the fundamental theory from our classes, what's happening within the system? And they started out by going to the fundamental theory for that piece of equipment. And then they quickly realized that there are outside influences that are also impacting the performance of that system, right? A distillation column has so many other aspects that are influencing how the column behaves. So being able to take those, understand those disconnects between what theory tells them it should be and what the data actually says is such a crucial part of what the reality of chemical engineering really is. Right. Our job as chemical engineers is to look at a system and say, hey, this isn't operating the way it was designed to do it. What's going on here and how do I fix it? How do I address the problem? Right. And that's using all of the skills from our courses across chemical engineering to do that. So with this project, I know you're in the early stages of this project. Do you have any uh, preliminary data that you can share, or maybe future uh, directions? Yeah, so for this upcoming ASWE conference, um, we are focusing on presenting the data that we gathered from faculty. Um, and what we've really recognized is that we gave this list of 13 typical learning outcomes that are covered in a unit operations course or covered in just a, an engineering laboratory course. They include things like communication, safety, ethics, um, data analysis, data collection, um, being able, like sensory, being able to recognize and hear how equipment is operating. Um, all of these, there are 13 different unit operation or 13 different learning outcomes. And I think our biggest takeaway is that faculty think all of them are important. So if you think about a course and the way that we can design a course, we can't cover 13 learning outcomes, right? So there has to be some level of choosing which learning outcomes are prioritized within a course and which ones are in other courses or, or downgraded, right, that aren't covered as significantly. But really, I think the biggest thing that we're finding is that there's a lot that faculty perceive should be covered within a unit operations course. And we need to continue by looking at the student data, the industry data to be able to narrow in on like, what are those key missing components that we think that they wouldn't get in other courses, right? And perhaps that is going to require more data collection of seeing where are these other learning outcomes covered across other parts of the curriculum, right? Because 13 learning outcomes is not feasible. So being able to, to narrow in on that, I think, is a really important part of what we'll need to focus on um, and focusing in on, on those skills that are are crucial just to a unit operations lab as opposed to skills that can be covered in other locations. Yeah, and that 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 gives a, a kind of like a sense of this expertise bias, right? That because you're experts on this topic, you think that everything is important. So the students, you forget how hard it is to learn or uh, this uh, things in, I don't know, 16 weeks, whatever is the length of the semester. I, I look forward to hear the opinions of the other stakeholders to provide some clarity uh, for the faculty. Um, Sarah, what recent project and upcom or upcoming project do you have that you're very excited about just to change a little bit the pace of the conversation? Yeah. So I, I think one of the things I'm really excited about moving forward in the next year or so is really transitioning from this diagnosis of the problem of what's happening related to mental health and engineering into actually interventions, right? So how can we actually take what we're learning and use that to implement interventions and ideally improve help seeking and then improve mental health within engineering? Um, and I think that's something that I'm really, really excited about taking that turn and saying, okay, we understand much more about the problem. How do we actually go through and, and design solutions now? And I'm really excited about that opportunity. And again, doing it in a way that I talked about, like this stakeholder engagement, I think is such a crucial part of designing interventions, right? If I'm trying to tell students, hey, you need to do this thing to fix your mental health or to, to make you more likely to seek help for your mental health. I can't just do that based on my own perspectives. I need to know what the students think that this should look like. Right. So I think a big part of what I'm really interested in in the next year or two years is really working on those intervention development and doing it in a way that we're taking into account what students think are some of these solutions. 
rather than just assuming and prioritizing solutions from our own perspectives. So I'm really excited about that opportunity and really hopefully being able to to make some really big impact as we move forward with that work. That is fantastic. Very student-centered approach. Yeah, looking forward to see the results. I'm going to put on the show notes uh, uh, Sarah's Google Scholar uh, page so they can follow uh, your notifications of new publications and things like that. So to move to the to the last section of the podcast, so, I mean, you were there a couple of years ago, right? So what advice or recommendation would you offer to those who are just starting their careers as engineering professors or just engineering educators, uh, re- uh, engineering researchers? So I would say my recommendation for both is identical. Um, I think a huge part of really what I have needed throughout my entire career from undergrad to graduate school to starting as a teaching faculty to starting as an engineering education faculty member um, is really finding the people that will support you. I think it's so crucial. I know for me, I would not be where I am without finding that support network, right? We talked briefly about how you and I, we sat down at AICHE in 2019 and we put together a timeline for submission of the reef and we really built each other up into doing that because I think one of the challenges that a lot of people face as faculty members in engineering is is imposter syndrome, right? Feeling like, why am I cut out to do this, right? Why am I cut out to apply for a grant in engineering education when I don't know how to do research in engineering education? So having that support network of people that can help to build you up and give you that confidence to do it and just go out on a limb and try these things, I think is so crucial. Um, And being able to send you a text on a Tuesday when I'm just feeling not in a confident place and have you build me back up, right? Or have you call me out on what I'm doing, right? And say, hey, you are doing too much of this. You need to focus, right? That's definitely something that happens not on an irregular basis. Um, And I think I hopefully do the same thing for you. But being able to have those people that just call you out when you're doing things that maybe aren't the best idea for you and your career and your mental health, right? And that's something that you called me out on before. Having that support network, I don't know where I would be without it. It definitely would not be in this current position. I think I still would be teaching faculty. I think I still would be successful as a teacher. But I think having this impact as a researcher in engineering education, that took a lot of going out on a limb and doing things that felt really scary. And I don't think that I would have done it without having you in the support network and having my mentors within my support network through the reef program um, to be able to go through that process, I think was so important. Yeah. The other part of that, just going to teaching, right? Getting started in teaching. I think oftentimes when you start, you think you have to do everything on your own and that you have to start from scratch in every single course that you teach. But that's not the reality of how we most effectively teach, right? I am willing to give every course that I have taught to other people. And you can teach it just the way that I taught it if you want to. I do recommend make it your own, right? Make it what works well for you. But the first time you teach a course, you're just trying to get through the content on your own, right? And and refresh the content and relearn the content. Because the reality is, even though we took thermodynamics as undergrads, we still have to relearn a lot of it. Right. So not being afraid to ask for other people's work, ask for other people's course notes and not being afraid to just take that and make it work for your own class and build it over time. You don't have to change every single thing the first time that you teach a course. I was really terrified of doing that when I first got started and having someone say, just take it and teach what I taught was really helpful because it's really overwhelming when you're really learning how to teach effectively, learning all of these new things all at the same time. So being able to have someone to help support you in that and have someone's notes based on the way that they taught the course really helps you to be more effective and helps us to just improve courses so much faster, right? If we all reinvent the wheel every time we go through and start teaching a class, It's just starting back at square one every single time rather than starting at a great place and improving upon it and then giving that to someone else to further improve upon. So I think that's something that's really important as well. Yeah, with the teaching, I remember I was in an AICHE conference and I met the author of the book that I was teaching and I was telling him like, oh, I really like this course. I wish I could improve things. And he said, do you want all my my notes? I'm like, 
Okay, so he shared with me a Google folder with his slides and Google Notes. And I, well, like you said, right, I just made it my own, but that, mm -hmm. I, uh, I mean, pay it forward, right? If you, if, I mean, you're not, it's not copyrighted. <laughs> Somebody's going to no. take that and it's going to make it better or it's going to just make it their own because at the, day of the, the, the end of the day, the, the materials of a course is just knowledge, but the teacher has an important role on making sure that that is communicated to the students. And our goal is to effectively teach students, right? So why am I going to make it more difficult for you to do that job, right? Me and the course that I've developed, if that can give you a good starting point so that you can be more effective in teaching your students, I'm totally fine for that. That's a win for everyone, right? It's not like it's hurting me or making more work for me in the future, because I can continue teaching the exact same course to you. It doesn't impact anyone. So I think it's really, exactly. really important. And that is connected with what you said before, when you create this network of mentors or peer mentors, or just, you know, people that your network, you know, I have been able to ask people that I know, hey, can you share with me your proposal so that I can see how it looks like? Of course, you're not going to copy because your idea is, this, is different, but you want to see examples of successful proposals that have been awarded in the program that you're submitting. Mm -hmm, exactly. And don't be afraid to ask, right? I think it can be scary and be intimidating to ask those questions. And I think I'm someone that definitely doesn't go out on that limb enough. I can be better at creating, asking and taking advantage of the network that I have a little bit more effectively. But don't be afraid to ask, right? Every time that I have had someone email me and ask for support, I have given it, right? Don't, someone told me the other day, don't give, or why are you taking away their opportunity to do that, right? Why are you get, taking away their opportunity to support you by just assuming that they're going to tell you no, right? If they want to tell you no, that's fine, but you're taking away the opportunity for someone else to, to pro provide that support for you by not asking the question, so kind of framing it in that way, I thought was really interesting because from my perspective, I love to help support other people that are coming into engineering education research and having those meetings and being able to provide knowledge of what I've learned is really important to me. So why am I going to take that opportunity away from other people by not asking them the question, right? Yeah, that's so true. So to conclude the, the interview, do you have any tools, software, resources, or strategies that um, you have found most, uh, most effective in your career that you can share with us? I think for me, again, like tying it back to other people, um, finding strong mentorship is a really, really important part, especially if you're transitioning from disciplinary research or teaching faculty position into educational research, finding that mentorship and finding other people that have learned this through their careers and their education, right? Um, is really important because it is a whole new field, right? Breaking into educational research and social science research is a whole new field that we're learning. So being able to take advantage and, and gain mentorship from others um, is a really important part of that. So don't be afraid to ask for mentorship. Don't be afraid to ask for collaboration um, because it's something that a lot of people are really interested in, in what we're doing in the educational space and engineering specifically. Um, so people are interested and they want to get involved. So give them that opportunity to help to support you through that. So I just want to say thank you so much, Dr. Wilson, for being with us today and for all of the dedication that you have put into educating, you know, engineering students inside, inside and outside chemical engineering, because you're now uh, doing more things uh, at the college level. So thank you so much again for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for your continued support as we work towards building a community that uplifts the experiences of practitioners and scholars in Indian education at any stage of their careers. I truly appreciate it. If you enjoyed this podcast and want to show some love, here are some few things you can do. Leave us a review on your favorite platform. Your reviews help others discover this incredible community. Spread the word and share this podcast with your colleagues, students, and even your social media followers. By doing so, you contribute to the growth of our community. Stay connected with us on Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, and YouTube. 
follow us and subscribe to engage with our content and stay updated on the latest episodes and discussions. Don't forget to check out the show notes. You will find valuable resources and information about our guest speakers there. Lastly, if you have any suggestions or ideas for future episodes or speaker, we'll love to hear from you. Fill out our feedback form and share your thoughts. That's all for now. Hasta luego.